I think we're good. Hi, I'm, I'm Laura. I'm with Michaels and I wanted to welcome you to our class with Beadalon. I'm excited you're here. We have Meredith and Yvette here from Beadalon with us today. They are going to be taking us through a lot of tips and techniques when it comes to sea beading and, and um, making some cool things. But I wanna, what I wanted to caution is, is that we want to go ahead and use this time for um, asking questions. We're going to have the chat room open. Um, we're going to have all the microphones muted so that way we can make sure that we can hear Meredith. Um, but go ahead and enter your questions over in the chat section and we will go ahead and funnel those. Um, Yvette and myself will, will send those over to Meredith to get some answers to all your questions today. So most important, have fun. We are going to be uh, recording this, uh, this class. It will be available on michaels.com slash classes as of tomorrow. Um, there is a PDF instruction sheet that was sent out earlier via email. Um, so if there's any questions, you can refer back to the handout and you can also refer back to the video starting tomorrow. So enjoy the class and please let me introduce you to Meredith. Hi, everybody. I am Meredith Roddy. I am the product marketing specialist and also design team member from Beadalon. This is my second Michaels class now. I'm so excited. You can find, I guess you can find the archive of the Beading 101 class <clears throat> that we did last year. We went over, or not last year, last week. We went over everything from soup to nuts about beading wire and crimping. So this class, we are just, I'm looking underneath my desk here. My dog found a little uh, bead mat and he is scratching it around. Never a dull moment here in the Beetle on Home Studio. Um, so this week we are going to be talking about making an illusion necklace with a product called Supplemax. So this is what Supplemax looks like and I'm going to talk about it just a little bit and then I will take um, the camera down and we will get to designing. And as Laura said in the very beginning, don't feel like you have to rush to make the project along with me. I love having students beading along with me, but take it slow, take the opportunity to ask me questions, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and really watch what I'm doing and then you can go back and beat along with me, perhaps on the replay. But if you do have any questions, like Laura said, put them in the comments. Yvette is here from the Beatalon office as well. And she is going to be typing the answers in the comment section. And if there's something major that I've glossed over or that I've forgotten, she'll interrupt me and give me a, give me a little pause to make sure that I get all of the information together. So without further ado, <clears throat> and it looks like Debbie just posted the instruction sheet. So if you want to go ahead and click on that in the comments and, um, and follow along, it's a very, very good kind of a, a next step project. So um, like I said, this is beading 102. We did 101 last week. And it's really um, when you're beading and learning all of the different skills, everything really does um, really does build on each other. And so I will probably be referring back to some of the information that I gave last week. So if you did watch, it's a really good extra, um, extra reinforcement for what we went over. But if you didn't get a chance to watch next week, I'll go over everything <clears throat> as we go along. So I think that I am ready to take my overhead camera. So give me just one moment. I'm going to come over here and change the camera view. <clears throat> and hopefully everybody can see that is one, I don't know what it looks like for everybody else, but for me, that is one big spool of Supplemax. So this is what I'm talking about. This is Supplemax monofilament illusion cord. So it's a clear cord, very, very similar to a fishing line and a place where a lot of beaters get their start. This is actually the material that I started using, gosh, when I was probably seven or eight years old. And I still have some designs that I have that I strung on monofilament way, way, way back when, when I um, raided my dad's tackle box for my jewelry making needs. So, um, much like on the spools of Beadalon wire, on the spool of Supplemax, there's a lot of really good information as well. Of course, everything is in three languages, um, which makes it a little bit cluttered, but once you know what you're looking for, you can really figure it out. 
So here um, you can see that this is the clear Supplemax. We also have it in a dark, um, in a black color. And then over here is the other really important number that you need to look at, and that's the diameter. And here in, um, in Pennsylvania, in America, we usually refer to the, um, the diameters in inches. Um, sometimes in millimeters, there really doesn't seem to be a good rhyme or a reason for it. But here with the Supplemax, um, I'll be referring to this as the 0 0.012 inches for the Supplemax. And 0 0.012 is, I believe it is the thinnest that we have available. There are several different diameters of the Supplemax, but this is a really, really good, um, like I said, a beginning stringing material, but also the perfect material for making what we are making today, which is an illusion necklace. I'm actually gonna put that down on the beading mat. <clears throat> And you can see that it really does, if the um, focus will take, sometimes you just have to wait a patient moment for, with my camera um, so to get everything in focus. And sometimes I have to kind of go like that to get it to work. Um, but you can see the beads and this monofilament practically disappears. And that makes for a beautiful bridal design, a beautiful party design. I love wearing something like this with a little black dress so that you can see um, that you can see it floating. I really like making this design with crystals, but I found that I really like making it with these little four millimeter gemstones as well. And that's what we're going to be working with today. So these are bead landing gemstones. And this is the Sesame Jasper in the four millimeter. Last week I worked with the, oh, I'm just totally blanking on the blue stone that I used last week. It'll come to me in a moment. Um, but that, these, these gemstones from Michael's are great. And I'm not just saying that because this is a Michael's class. I'm saying that because I really like them. Okay. So a couple of things that we need to be able to make this project. And if you do have the project sheet that um, Debbie and that Yvette has posted, all of the, um, the part numbers that you need are on that sheet. But just to go over, we're going to be using Supplemax. And last week we talked a lot about crimp tubes and crimp bead sizes. And this week we are going to be using the smallest of the crimp tube and that is a size, just looking for it here on the thing, a size one. So there are four sizes of crimp tubes and four sizes of crimp beads, and they come in these um, cute little, little containers. It depends if, you've, if you have an older label or a newer label. But they, um, there are four sizes in each of the variety packs that you can find at Michael's. These are both size one because that is what we are going to be using today. And we also talked last week about the three different sizes of crimp tools. And because we are using the micro, I'm sorry, because we are using the smallest of the crimp tubes, the size one, we're going to need to be using a micro, micro crimping plier. If you try to use a standard crimping plier or the mighty crimping plier, you're going to destroy your crimps and probably destroy your stringing material as well. So um, that actually put a really good comment in the comment section, and I do want to call attention to it just in case um, people are wondering about what I'm talking about. So fortunately, I don't have, I'm looking around, I don't have a spool of wire in my, um, at my arm's reach. That's, what, that's why you never clean your studio, guys. So if you put everything away, you're going to not be able to, to grab it when you need it on camera. But beading, bead stringing wire, that we talked about last week, is a stainless steel nylon coated wire. So Supplemax is a clear monofilament. So a totally different material for a totally different use. And someone asked how long is the Supplemax? Here you can see this is a 50 meter spool. And then just the part number and a little, little more information. So just like you do with our beading wire, you take the clip off and pull out a length. 
Now, in last class, and again, I will refer to that often, and please, if you haven't had a chance to watch that class, um, I'm sure that our friends at Michaels can repost the link um, and you can go and find it. Um, but I always work from the spool, whether I'm using bead stringing wire or artistic wire, German style wire, any wire that comes on a spool, wildfire, I, unless the project calls, you know, doesn't lend itself for it. I always work from the spool because that way I waste a lot less of the material that I'm using. So I'm gonna put that just to the side. And the first step, the first thing I'm going to do for my project is I'm going to attach half of the clasp. And I always attach the smallest part of the clasp first. Um, whether it is a toggle, whether it is a ring with a, some sort of a, whatever it is, I always do the smaller part first. I'm not sure if there's a real reason for doing that. I just feel like it's easier to do the bigger, it's easier when you get around to the other side if you have the bigger part left. I kind of said that backwards, but oh, that's wonderful. That thank you so much for posting that link. Okay, so I think I'm ready to do the first step. So let's just get, get right into it. I'm going to use my number one crimp tubes. Again, these are the smallest of the crimp tubes. And to get these little stoppers out, I like to kind of loosen it with my thumb and get the, um, the jaws of my chain nose pliers underneath and then pull it out. And it's just we're, we're in the classes, it's good to kind of give those extra tips and tricks, um, different things to know um, to, um, to make our beating lives easier. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna mess with my camera too much. I just, I'm going to take a moment and just try to lift this up just the tiniest bit to try to get a better, a better focus angle. Um, Let's see if we if that makes makes a little bit of a better difference. Laura, feel free to chime in if um, if I messed it up or if I'm doing something. But I think I think that that's a little bit better. I always like getting as close as I possibly can when um, when I'm teaching. But of course, it doesn't help anybody if it's blurry and nobody can see, right? So let's. I'm just going to move some things out of the way here. So my first step is going to be. Um, adding the smallest part of my class. So I like to use these um, Beetle on Variety Packs. They come with all of the materials that you need to get started making jewelry, really. Um, we've got a bunch of clasps, a bunch of jump rings, and these great tags that go on the second part of the class, and they come all together on a ring, which um, you wouldn't appreciate as much until they came without all of the tags on the ring, and then you had to chase them all over. So I'm gonna pull one of these out and put it aside and put that back. Okay, so um, just a real quick reminder about the, um, about the crimping technique. So these are the smallest of the crimp tubes. So everything that I'm going to be doing is going to be very small. If you want a real good um, one, two, three punch on crimping, again, go back and watch the bead stringing 101 that we did last week. So I have my crimp tube on and my tag part of the clasp, I'm going to take the monofilament or the supplemax around that clasp and back through the crimp tube. And everything, like I said, is super duper small today. So if you are going along with me, I'd actually love to know in the comments if people are making along with me, but don't feel, um, don't feel like you need to keep up. <laughs> um, this is a great way to kind of um, watch the class through once and then be able to have the opportunity to go back again and again. 
So the crimping process is a three start step process and I'll just go, just go over it very quickly because we do have some, some time because once we start getting going in the class, it's, um, it's going to go really quickly. Oh, look at that shot. That's exactly where I need to be. Okay, so you can see there is the front part of the crimping pliers that is, a, it's almost like an oval shape. And then the next part in has a little divot, a little dent in it. So the way that it works is I'm going to put this crimp tube in the front jaw, the back jaw, and then back in the front jaw again. And that is going to be the perfect technique for making a perfectly crimped crimp tube. So let's see, I'm gonna do this so that you guys can see and that I can see. Usually it's one or the other, either you can see or I can see. Let's try to get that focus before I do the deed. There we go, okay. So I'm gonna come in the front and I'm gonna compress it so that it is a, an oval. I'm going to come in the back and I'm gonna compress it again. And then I'm going to come back to the front. Ooh, get my tag out of the way. This is one of those times that I need to see. And one of the things about crimping is you want to use your tool around. So I'm moving my tool around that, um, around that bead. I am not smashing it. When you are doing crimping, for, um, for holding a clasp at the end, you do not want to smash that crimp, okay? Give it, I always give it a little tug to make sure it took, and then since I'm doing an illusion necklace and nothing is going to be covering this, I'm just gonna snip at my very most end that off. And you wanna make sure that you snip off the tail and not your long part. Okay, so now, this is one of those times that you actually want to um, want to cut your supple max from your spool. So I'm going to make a 16 inch necklace. So I have my measuring device right here and I have my tag on the one side. And let's see, do I want to use a spring ring or a lobster clasp? I think for today, I'm feeling like I'm going to use a lobster clasp. You can use um, really anything um, that you want as a clasp on the side. You could use a, um, a toggle, you could use a magnet, you could use a spring ring, you could use a lobster. The thing that you want to make sure, especially when you are doing a very, very light design, is that if your, your clasp is too heavy, it's going to pull it back in the back. So that's one of the things that you want to think about when you're doing jewelry construction, which is kind of a jewelry making 103 kind of a topic, is make sure that it's not too thick for, I'm sorry, not too heavy. So I'm um, measuring out 15 and a half inches. And if I wanted to be super duper, um, uh, precise about everything, I would do a better job measuring but hey Meredith um, I'm not going to do that yes I'm back just a quick rundown um if you want to go over like the terminology of the findings what we call why they're called well not why they're called findings but a lobster clasp um people aren't familiar with the like what the difference is between a lobster clasp and a spring ring or yeah I mean because if we're saying a lobster clasp uh, maybe people don't know exactly what that yep. is sure this is a lobster clasp this guy right here and then here I have a spring ring, I hope. Well, we'll show this, we'll show this one. This one is a spring ring. And it opens like this. And unfortunately, I don't think I have a toggle at my fingertips, but maybe at the end I can grab something and show um, what a toggle clasp might look like. But the whole genre of this kind of material is, um, those are called findings. Um, so, yeah, I think we're ready to start crimping. Okay, so now what we're doing for our illusion necklace is we're making these stations, right? These different, um, 
different components around the mono the monofilament, the supple max. So what it is is it's a crimp bead, a bead bead, and then another crimp bead or crimp tube. I use the terms crimp bead and crimp tube interchangeably. And when you are making this kind of design, this is the only, and I will say that several times to drive the point home, the only time that I will allow you to smash your crimp tube flat. So not at the end of your design, not at the beginning of your design, not near your clasp, not, I don't think there is any other allowable or permissible opportunity to flatten a crimp except right here next to your beads in your illusion necklace. And that's because you're really not using them as a, a, a structural a, a structural component. It's not holding your necklace together. What it is, is it's just holding that bead in place. So let me put that one aside and we're going to get started. So a nice trick, and there are a couple of different ways to make your spacing. The one that I like to use is using a straw. You can use a beadboard, you could use um, a tape measure, you can use a ruler, you can eyeball it. But I find that using a straw just makes it easier for me. Um, I have a straw here. Usually when I do this, I'll use a coffee stir. Um, it's kind of whatever I have at the ready. So I just eyeballed that for um, against what I had made before. But it's about an inch and a half. A little more than an inch and a half. I'll give it a little, a little trimmy trim. You can make this space however long or however short you want it to be. It could be a half of an inch. It could be two inches. Um, it's really, that is a totally personal opinion, but an inch and a half is kind of my sweet spot where I like to be when I'm using four millimeter beads. Um, so I have my supple max off of the spool. And to get that space, all I'm going to do is thread my straw on. Now, this is going to come right off the other side because it's such a thin or such a thick straw and such a small class, but that's fine. I'm just going to lay it down because really all I'm doing is I'm using it to measure. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to pick up one of these little crimp tubes and you can see I didn't pick up the crimp tube and try to, to push it on here with my supple max. That's never going to be an, un, um, an unfrustrating um, thing to do. So you always want to just keep it on your bead mat and pierce it with your material. So if you're doing any kind of crimping or seed beading or um, you know anything where you're trying to pick up something small, that's one of my favorite tips to give to people um, who have not done this before. You just pierce it and it'll come right on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my straw to measure it out. And if you don't have a straw, you can use a ruler. You can put a ruler here and just measure it on the ruler. I just find that it's, it's one of those tips that I picked up along the way that just makes it a lot easier for me. So again, this is the only time that it is okay. Just gonna straighten out my camera a little bit. The only time that it is going to be okay to smash your crimps. And I'm gonna come right in here with my chain nose pliers and smash my crimp flat, okay? So I'll show that again a couple times closer up to the camera but right like that. So I have my, my one and a half inch um, space of the supple max and then my crimp tube smashed flat. And I feel like there was one other thing that I wanted to say, but we'll, we'll come back around to it. Okay, oh, I know what I wanted to say. So what I'm using today for my tools, these are the, um, the sparkle handle chain nose pliers. These are one of my favorite lines from the Beadalon pliers line. Um, if people want, we can talk a little bit more about tools at the end. I can talk about tools for a long time. Um, and over my sparkle handle pliers, I have these um, fashion grips, and they just make it a little bit more comfortable for me to hold my pliers um, and also to identify them. And both of these are, av are available in Michaels. Um, so my next step, of course, 
if I'm following along with my example, is of course I need to put on a four millimeter bead. And again, what is this? They are the four millimeter, they have a cool name, Sesame Jasper. And they're all different colors and I love them. They go from pink to kind of a taupe to an almost a salmon orange kind of color. It's a really, really pretty strand. And they have all kinds of um, interesting inclusions in them. That's what that little spot in the bead is called. If I can get it into focus, my camera, we're gonna have to work on this so that, remind me to talk to John about the camera. Um, at any rate, there's an inclusion in there. And that's what it's called when you see the little spots in the gemstones. Um, those are called inclusions. And I think that that is what gives um, gemstones the best, um, their personality. Okay, so I just picked up again, but we're using the piercing me method, a, another crimp tube. And I'm going to pull that down right up against that bead. See, when the focus is in focus, it's perfect. It's just getting it there. There's gotta be something that I'm, that I'm missing. So now I have that crimp tube right against the bead and I'm gonna come in with my, my chain nose pliers. We can also be called needle nose pliers, but the difference between these needle nose pliers and the needle nose pliers that you might find in um, your, uh, tools from the tool shop are these do not have those ridges. They're nice and smooth, which makes them jewelry pliers. So I'm going to come in here right over that bead. And I like to try, I don't always succeed, but I try to make sure that my um, crimp tubes are all in plane, um, which means they're all going the same way when I crimp them down. This one, it did not happen. The other one might work. And I also always have just a little bit of wiggle room in here. Again, I'm big on wiggle room when it comes to beading. Um, if there isn't enough wiggle room um, built into all of your beading designs, that's when things start to, to snip and snap. Um, and uh, when your jewelry starts failing on you. All right, so part one, done. Whew, let's all breathe a sigh of relief. We got our first one down. Now it is time to get to the second one. So I'm gonna use my straw again, and I'm going to put it on. Um, if you're using a coffee stirrer, sometimes you'll have to, to slit it up the end because it might not be able to slide off over your beads once you start adding beads, but no, no big thing. So now I'm gonna come in here again. Um, pick up a crimp tube, slide it down. And the thing I like about this also is it took me a while to get there, but not every single space has to be exactly, completely the most precise. Um, it's okay if one is a couple of millimeters a couple of millimeters um, shorter or a couple of millimeters longer. All right, so now I'm here. Again, I'm doing this down on my bead mat so that I can make sure that this space is good. I have my straw up against that bead there and I'm going to flatten my crimp. Okay, so it just flattens right down. Again, this is the only time that it is okay to flatten your crimps. Okay, because all we're doing is we're using it as a space. Um, I'm sorry, as a holder for those beads. So this time I'm gonna grab one of these darker colors um, so you can see how cool um, this strand is. So here on that same strand is a really a nice light bead with that kind of funky inclusion. And then here on that very same strand, I keep forgetting what these are called, Sesame Jasper like open sesame. So now this one is kind of that darker salmon color. It's really neat stones. I don't know about you guys, but I, I love beads <laughs> and I love, I keep seeing um, these funny little um, sayings that pop up on Facebook and in different places that say things like um, buying beads and making jewelry are two totally different um, hobbies. And I, I, I do believe that. Meredith, I do, people are I just asking if um, the crimp tubes, um, if they tend to scratch your neck because you're flattening them? That is a really good question. Because of the 
the beads should really hold, like the, this bead is what's going to be against your neck because the crimp tubes are so small. If you were having a problem and the crimps were bothering your neck, you could do two things. One, you could put a crimp cover over them and I can demonstrate that if we have a little bit of time and I think we will have some time. I can demonstrate putting a crimp cover over it. Um, the other option is to use a bigger bead because what the, the bigger beads will do is to offset that, um, those little scratchy crimps. Um, but that, that tends to be a, um, a person, like a personal thing. Some people might be a lot more bothered by it than others, but that's a really good question. Um, okay. So now what I'm ready to do is smash this down again, just like that. And that's really it. <laughs> Once you get the uh, smash the one, put the bead on, smash the other, um, just make sure that you're taking your time so that you don't end up with two crimp beads um, or a skipped bead. Um, and then you continue along. And I have one that I have done um, almost all of. And you can see, so I actually, I started, I did the opposite of what I usually do. I put my clasp on first um, because it really, it really doesn't matter. It's just one of those things that I'm oftentimes in the habit of, um, oh, I know why I did that. You know why guys? Because I couldn't find my, um, <laughs> I could not find my tags last night. That was a fun, a fun project, tearing apart my studio, trying to find the tags, which should have been in here the whole time. And because I was so, um, I don't know, out of my skull last night looking for them, I just, all I saw was the ring. I didn't actually see the tags. They were there the whole time. Yep, that was a good one. Good one, Mare. All right, so I'm gonna do one last one over here and then we're gonna add our class. And then I'll show um, using the, um, the three millimeter crimp covers from the crimp cover variety pack um, to, um, to cover up those crimps in case it's bothering anyone. So I do also wanna show, so here, oh, I've lost my crimp tube, I put it on. Well, of course it's sliding down in there. You just slide it right back out. And that's why it's good to lay it down um, to do your crimping. And again, like I mentioned in the very beginning, if you want to use a beadboard to do this or, or um, a ruler to do this, that's awesome too. I just, I like along the way, I, I got the tip to use a straw and it's just, it's kind of stuck with me. Um, I really, I just find that that's the easiest for me to, um, to be able to do. So let me take my straw off the right way, shall I? And now I have my one crimp tube and let's see, I think I'm going to end with a nice light color again. And you could, if you wanted to, you could do this very um, uh, specifically and do, you know, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, or, or you know, a rainbow with colors or um, all, clear beads, which would be really cool, or all silver beads, which would also be really cool. Um, I love that what kind of, once you learn the basic technique on doing this, you're good to go. And I'm, I'm looking up and it says, um, yes, Cynthia, you can definitely use two beads, but what is a bead board? That is a very good question. A bead board is a device. It's a board, a board, <laughs> a board, and it has channels in it. And those channels allow you to place your design out so that you can see it before you string it. And there are usually, I don't know, maybe three or four channels. And depending on the design of the beadboard, sometimes there is a, um, a place for making bracelets. Some of them are long and straight. Um, but if you Google beadboard or of course go to michaels.com and search up beadboard, you can see, um, see the pictures. I'm, I am not necessarily, I, I don't use a beadboard that often, um, but I know that a lot of people find it to be a very, very helpful tool, especially when they're just getting started beading. So I have now strung up one last crimp tube and I'm going to come around with my tag 
And one thing that I forgot to do, but it's no big deal, is to put on my straw because I want to make sure that I have not only the, um, gotta get my that crimp tube out of the way. I wanna make sure that both my starting space and my ending space are the same. And yeah, that should be about, about right. I think I just kind of have an eyeball. These ones, I didn't have a straw down here, so I just kind of eyeballed them. All right, so I have my crimp tube on. Meredith, sorry to yes. interrupt. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, B is asking, what is the largest millimeter size bead that you would recommend using? And Cynthia is asking, if you use two beads, do you need a crimp in between or something else? Those are very, very good questions. So um, the first question, wait, tell me what was the first question again about, I'm sorry. The, what is the largest size bead that you would recommend using? The largest size bead that? I think I would answer that question by saying whatever is comfortable for you. So you could go up to, I don't know, a 14 millimeter bead if you had an acrylic bead. Um, that would be a lighter bead that you could use for this. It's just going to be um, a, a heavier necklace overall. All you want to make sure is that the crimp tubes, when you flatten them, don't allow the beads to slip through. So all those crimp tubes or crimp beads are doing are holding that bead in place. So if you have larger beads and you use a size two or a size three or maybe even a size four, um, you would just kind of have to play around with making sure that the crimp tube that you are flattening held that bead in place. And then for the second question, if you wanted to use two beads, awesome. You could use four beads. You could use as many beads as, or as few beads as you wanted. And I think then it becomes a design question. Do you want a spacer in between each of those beads or do you want a, a, um, a station of all of those beads together? And I think that either way, it would look really, really neat. Did I do a good job? Hopefully. Okay. Um, yeah, so Karen actually also asked a really good question, which is, can you use um, a silk or polycord? Yes, and that is a class for a different day. <laughs> we should do that as a class, Laura, for our next, um, for our next round. We should do a nodding class. Love that. It's definitely next level, um, but people, people love it. Okay, so now um, I have my crimp tube on. And let me move some of this stuff out of the way. It's always a sign of a good beading class when your bead mat is um, filled with supplies. So I have my, um, my crimp tube and my class, the second half of my class, and I'm going to come back through my crimp tube. And I think that of all of the steps, this is the one that's the fiddliest. Um, and it's really not that fiddly. Um, so it's, it's a really good testament to what a good um, kind of beginner intermediate project this is. Um, and depending again on how precise you want to be, you want to make sure that you are tightening up your crimp tube and making sure that that space is the right space. However, the important thing also, and I'm going to bring this all the way up to the camera, is you want to make sure that you don't have this crimp tube all the way up. I see a lot of beginner beaters tightening their crimps and their materials all the way to the end of the clasp, and you don't want to do that for a couple of different reasons. The first of which is, again, what we talked about a lot last week, which is friction. So the tighter this is, the more tension and the more friction is being put on that material against that metal. And what is metal going to do to a stringy material? It is going to cut it eventually, especially if it gets tugged on um, by a baby or by a friend or by anything. Um, so you want to make sure that you, again, I come back to my favorite term, that wiggle room, about a quarter of an inch in here, you want to make sure that you have for that tag to move freely. And I have that built in 
on this side as well. You always want to make sure that you have that wiggle room built in. Um, and, th and that isn't the case for all materials and all designs, but anything with a crimp tube, I think is a good rule of thumb that you want to, um, come on camera, work with me, not against me. I feel like as soon as I give up, it's like, all right, Meredith, here you go. Okay, so I'm going to double check again. I am a bad measure twicer um, and cut oncer. That is what makes me kind of a, a, um, a renegade or a, what is the right word that I'm looking for? A not such a great sewer. <laughs> it's because I have a tendency to measure once and then just hope for the best. Um, but in this case, I measured twice because I want to make sure I do a good job for everybody. And oh, I did the thing that I told everybody not to do because I was in the groove with it. Uh, what did I do that I shouldn't have done, everybody? I flattened my clasp at the end, but I caught it right before I got it all the way down. So I'm going to come back in with my crimping pliers. I was waiting for somebody on the other end to be like, no, no, stop, don't do it. Even Laura let me get away with it. <laughs> Even if that let me get away with it. So I'm going to come in here with my, um, my micro crimping pliers, which again, you can find at Michael's and come in and do that back part and the front part. And I think, I don't think I ruined it too, too badly. I think I'm able, I caught myself right in time. So you get into a groove with doing something one way and you got to remember that um, don't do, don't flatten your crimps where they need to, um, where they need to hold your clasps on. So again, I want to make sure I don't cut my necklace. I cut off that edge and I'm going to snip that off. And the tool that I use, I'm using to do this, these are the beetle on, it's the beetle on nipper tool. And it actually has black handles, but again, I'm using my fashion grips just because they look pretty and they give a little bit of extra cushioning, um, especially when you're doing a lot of repetitive movements. Okay, and so now I'm going to slide my straw off and go ahead and close that. And now I have a really, oops, a really pretty, I feel like I always do that a really pretty um, necklace that is going to lay beautifully on my neck. Now, somebody had asked the question about what happens if these little crimp tubes become scratchy because you flatten them. And I do have within arm's reach, if you will bear with me, I have the variety pack of crimp covers. Now, crimp covers are these little seamed beads, and they are, um, in the crimp variety pack, there are three millimeter, four millimeter ridges, 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 and sparkles. And because we're using the smallest of the crimp tubes, the micro, or the size um, one crimp tubes, I'm going to use the three millimeter crimp covers. A question that we get a lot at Beetleon is uh, what crimp covers should you use with what size crimp crimps, crimp tubes or crimp beads? And the easiest answer is the one that fits. <laughs> so if you have a variety pack, you can, um, you can very easily um, see which one is going to be the best size um, to cover it. And so all you do, and let me, um, Bring that off and show that again. So this is what it looks like. It's kind of like a Pac-Man, right? A little Pac-Man. And you just slip that over the, um, you slip that over the crimp tube. So let's see if I can't do that again. Okay, perfect. So you just slip it over the crimp tube. And um, in Bead Stringing 101 last week, I did say that I I have a lot of things in beading that I am very, very good at. Closing crimp covers is not one of them. <laughs> I, I, I really struggle with doing it um, so that I don't mar the crimps. It's just one of those things that I haven't practiced enough 
I don't use crimp covers on all of my designs. Um, and even now, this one is much, much better than the one that I did last week. Um, you just have to very slowly and very steadily use your chain nose pliers. And again, I'm using small movements and I'm coming all the way around it to cover that up. And actually, I think I can stop saying that I'm not good at doing it. That one is pretty darn good. Um, another thing, another tool that you can use to, um, to close your crimp covers is a, I'm just looking for it over here on my tool bench, um, but you can use the Mighty Crimping Tool. Here it is. The Mighty Crimping Tool, the top jaw is also um, a really good um, tool to use to close those crimp covers. So let me just show you that one more time. So I've done it on the one side and now I can come and do it on the other side as well. So let me grab another one of those three millimeters. And I think that the four millimeter will be too big because the, the hole will, um, will not hold the crimp tube in place. It will slip out. So you will have um, gone to all of the effort to cover up to cover up that crimp all nicely and then it will slip out and then that will be sad. So let me slip this one on and if you know that you're using crimp covers you might want to just build in a little bit of extra let's all say it together wiggle room in between your um in between your crimp and your bead so that it has a little bit of um, extra space to be able to slide on. See, I'm kind of struggling a little bit with this one because this one was pretty tight. So let me see if I can't <clears throat> get that down there. The other thing that you can do if you need to is use an awl to open up the crimp tube or the crimp cover a little bit. So an awl is this guy here, a beading awl. Mine has glue on it because I use it to um, to uh, clean out the two <laughs> the tips of my glue. Um, but this is like a, a beading awl is kind of your a workhorse of your beading stash. They have a variety of uses. I feel like I'm always um, I'm always I'm actually going to use it right now. I'm always um, grabbing for mine um and actually you know what i'm going to do i'm just going to use a different crimp cover rather than um take the time to get that opened up but you, you can open them up really easily here's one that's a little bit more open um but yeah i i like crimp covers but you can see that it's going to add a lot to the design so whereas this is really small and unassuming, um, this really makes it more of a three bead design. So let's see if I can't get this guy on here. There we go, see, snapped right on. And again, I'm just coming in. I like to start bringing the, um, the two sides together like this and then Kind of work it around as much as I can to get those um, to get those sides closed and sometimes it works faster than others but again slow and steady you just want to bring the sides together so that there's no more seam there not bad right but again you can see the difference between the two the one that has the crimp covers on it and then the one that doesn't so again, it becomes a matter of personal preference for which one you like the look of better. So are there any other questions? Laura, is there anything else that I should go over? We, um, we covered everything that I kind of set out to do at the beginning to show how to make an illusion necklace. Can you think of anything else in here that you want me to show? Anything that you'd like me to show again? I, we've been keeping up with the questions that have been coming in. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and, and add them in. There's a question about design elements. Like what, what could you do? Like if you had this, if 
you had this necklace and wanted to do something you know, to personalize it for yourself, you know, add a charm or anything like that? Oh my gosh, I love adding charms. Um, you could add a charm in, since I did this with a, an even number, so two, four, six, eight beads. So you could hang a charm from the bottom for sure. Um, you could, I really like hanging charms from my clasp. Um, the challenge there though is because this is so light, you only have eight beads. You want to make sure that your clasp is also going to be light because otherwise when you wear it, it's going to pull back. So you just want to make sure that if you had, if you had a clasp here at the bottom, perfect because it's going to hang down, but it's also going to to take the shape of the necklace from a circle to more of a, an oval, I guess. So it's really just thinking about how you want it to lay. Do you have a, a dress with a circular neckline? Do you have a V neckline? Um, so depending on kind of how you want the, the necklace to be with your, um, with your outfit that you're wearing, because I don't know about you, but I uh, will almost always design the necklace for the outfit or buy the outfit for the necklace like to make sure that I have it done um, and then somebody else asked about the blue tool I'm just looking in the comments also this is a beading all if you do not have a beading all in your tool repertoire um, that is one of the top top tools I reach for this all all the time get it all the time yeah <laughs> that'll be a fun one to see on the replay how about a multi-strand illusion necklace? Oh my gosh, I love that idea. And that is where having a beadboard comes in really handy because you can really, um, you can lay it out so that do you want your, your um, beads to be next to each other? Do you want them to be offset? Do you wanna say hi to a furry friend <laughs> who's come to say hello to everybody? Finn does love a Zoom call. You're a goofy dog. Do you want to go underneath? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I love the idea. I love the idea of make, maybe making a, like a statement illusion necklace where you have, you know, all different kinds of different, different beads. Maybe it's symmetrical. Maybe it's asymmetrical. Um, oh my gosh, now I want to make one. <laughs> Who asked that question? Send me a photo of what you make. Send it through the Beetlehead page. I want to see, and I'll send you mine, mine back. Um, so somebody is saying the hardest part is crimping the tubes on the ends. Crimping is really, it's, it, I feel like people gloss over the crimping part. That, in my opinion, is the most important thing to practice when you are making jewelry, maybe wrapped loops also, which we're going to get to actually next week, we're doing simple loops and wrapped loops. That's going to be a fun one um, because that's really the foundation for any uh, adding of adornments and sparkles and dangles and doodads to all of your work is making sure that you get your loops done right. But crimping really is one of those things that you just, you have to practice it you have to be okay with restringing something if you didn't do it right, and then just breathe. It's very, it's a three-step process. Breathe your way through it. Don't get stressed. Um, and then allow, allow yourself, give yourself grace to make mistakes. Um, it's, it's okay when we're practicing um, to make mistakes. It does not have to be perfect the first time. It took me a very long time as a beater to get there, um, but I give, I give permission to everyone just to practice and have fun with it because making jewelry is so rewarding. Um, and once you get the basics down, it's, it's a, lot, um, a lot easier and a lot more fun than, um, than you might think otherwise. Hey, Meredith, I know we're coming up on time. Yes. Uh, next week, we do not have a class because of the holiday. That's right. Um, but we do have you coming back on July 10th, same time, 3 o'clock Central Time. Give us a quick rundown. We're, we're making, we're using uh, wire gauges, learning the simple loop, the wrapped loop, um, how to do a hook clasp. Talk to us a little about what's coming next. Uh, well, that's, that's it. <laughs> 
<laughs> you ruined it all, Laura. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so what we're, we're doing exactly what Laura said, but then we are going to take those, those three skills, a simple loop, a racked loop, and a hook clasp, and we're going to turn it into a bracelet. So the project becomes the learning process. Um, but once you learn, like I was saying, once you learn really those two loops and the, the hook class is kind of an extra added bonus fun thing. Um, but then you can add, you can do charm necklaces, charm bracelets. You can add a, a special signature charm. So if you decide that you love doing this and you want to make jewelry always and forever, um, you might want to have a, a little, um, a little stamp that has your own personal logo on it that you wanna include on everything. And sure, you can use a jump ring and maybe we'll start with jump rings actually. That's a good idea for our next class. We'll start with jump rings and then we'll move into loops and wrap loops and then the class. Um, but it really, it's, it's, the next, it's the next progression. So we, in the first class, we learned all about crimping and all about beading wire. Here we learned about another material, supple max, and taking that crimping and using it in a little bit of a different, a different um, way. And so the next class will be starting inner, starting beginner and really intermediate wire work. So we're kind of we're we're building our jewelry making skills. So by the end of everything, um, we'll we'll all be wonderful beaters with great skills and great practices. Yes. Well, on that note, Meredith, Yvette, I want to say thank you. We enjoyed another class learning learning myself over here as well. So thank you very much. I hope everybody had a great time. Um, please go back and register for Meredith's next class. It's on michaels.com slash classes. That's also where you will find the video um, posted tomorrow um, to be able to watch this back as well as any other classes that you'd like to see. So thank you again and have a good day. Bye, have a good day.